So maybe you're afraid to take in omega-3s. Okay? Maybe you're afraid of taking a rancid fish oil pill that's gonna trigger some kind of oxidative stress within your body. Maybe you've heard that it can affect energy manufacturing in the mitochondria. Maybe you've heard that taking in fish oil and slowing down the inflammatory response is actually not a good thing. Look, these are all viable things. And I wanna take a look at the data that is demonstrating that and see what people are talking about but I also want to compare it with other data that is in favor of omega-3s so that we can come to a solid conclusion. At the end of this video, I'll give you a few tips on how to choose the right fish oil as well. So let's go ahead and dive in. Let's start with the inflammatory system, okay? Omega-3s are largely known for being, well, modulators of inflammation. That's why a lot of people take them. So when you look at the data, you say, okay, if you take in omega-3s, you're quelling inflammation and that can actually be a bad thing. It can quell the immune response, it can trigger some issues that wouldn't be there otherwise. So there's a study that was published in the journal Prostaglandins, Leukotrienes and Essential Fatty Acids. Okay, and what this demonstrated is that, yeah, when omega-3s were taken in high amounts, it did have the effect on clearance in uh, acute infections in terms of how fast the pathogens were cleared out. What this essentially means is, if there is like a really quick infection or something that's happening fast, you could end up coming up to an issue where omega-3s are making it so those pathogens don't get out of the system very fast. However, when you look at the data, they're taking in a lot of omega-3s, a whole lot, to the point where you really are mega-dosing it and having this powerful anti-inflammatory effect that really isn't reasonable. Okay, I'm all in favor of mega-dosing fish oil now and then, but operative words, now and then. Okay, you shouldn't be taking copious amounts all the time because yeah, you can quell the inflammatory response. And additionally, you can even lower what is called immune surveillance. Okay, you can lower the ability of the immune system to detect things because the immune system is always kind of activated, looking for things, looking for good things, bad things, right? So you just have to monitor that. And there's a lot of evidence that demonstrates that really you don't get a whole lot of benefit as far as like cardiovascular benefits are concerned above like 500 to 1000 milligrams per day of omega-3s. So unless you're after something very specific, you're really fine to continue to consume probably like 500 to 1000 milligrams of fish oil a day. Now the other concern that people have is that omega-3s can negatively impact what's called the electron transport chain. You have to go down some rabbit holes to find this kind of stuff, but you find that, yeah, they say omega-3s can affect energy manufacturing within the mitochondria. Okay, I know where this data is coming from. Predominantly rodent models, which is fine. I reference rodent models all the time, but most of the data is utilizing absurd amounts of omega-3s. Like in the rodent models, like absurd amounts that humans would never take in their scaled dosages. Okay, in fact, if you look at most of the data surrounding omega-3s, it's actually very beneficial for mitochondrial health. The Journal of Physiology had published a cool study. They took a look at 18 men, okay, and they gave them two grams of EPA and one gram of DHA, the two common forms of uh, omega-3s, okay, and they had them take those for 12 weeks. Okay, the results were pretty interesting. They found that they had an increase of EPA in the membrane, the mitochondria, by 450%, okay, and they had an increase in the DHA by 320%. Those are significant, significant improvements in the overall omega-3 content of a membrane, which is demonstrating that you are probably improving what's called membrane fluidity, which we'll talk about in just a moment. The most important thing that they found here is that it improved the sensitivity of the mitochondrial membrane to ADP. So it was able to improve how much ADP crossed over the mitochondrial membrane to produce ATP. If you're familiar with uh, cellular respiration and how we produce energy in the body, ATP, adenosine triphosphate, is like the energy currency. The phosphate molecule is cleaved off and we have energy creation. If we do not have ADP crossing over the mitochondrial membrane, we cannot produce ATP and therefore cannot produce energy. So in essence, more sensitivity to ADP, being able to cross through the membrane because of omega-3s in this particular case, having a, you know, an influx of that, that results in potentially more energy manufacturing and more mitochondrial just efficiency, if you wanna call it that. So omega-3s are a huge part of the mitochondrial membrane. And the mitochondrial membrane needs to remain what is called fluid, just like it implies, right? It, fluidity means that things can flow through it. A rigid cell membrane 
does not transport things across very well. Okay, proteins, lipids, things like that need to cross through that mitochondrial membrane to be able to influence the proper kinetics of the electron transport chain. If a membrane is rigid, when a signal or a protein or a compound or whatever hits the membrane and it hits its receptor, the receptor is not able to send a signal because it's too rigid. There's too much of a rigid membrane. It can't transmit the signal properly. Therefore, that is disrupting the electron transport chain. So when you look at the big picture with this, it's actually the other way around. A potential lack of omega-3 could be playing a more detrimental role in how we manufacture energy, not the other way around. In fact, there was a study that was published in the journal FASEB, took a look at subjects that consumed 1,070 milligrams of omega-3s. Okay, in this case, it was eight weeks. And they found that, hey, they had an increase in omega-3 content and fluidity in red blood cells. Okay, we're seeing that exactly in red blood cells. We're seeing it in mitochondrial situations. Okay, so I kind of rest my case on that one. I think that's a little bit unfounded because you're taking extreme situations there. Now, I'm gonna get into some more data and I'm gonna get into some tips on choosing the right kind of fish oil, but it probably is important to note that getting your omega-3s from a whole food form is usually the best. I just wanna make sure I make that mention. Okay, whether that's gonna be like sardines, whether it's gonna be salmon, whether it's gonna be uh, mackerel, whether it's gonna be really good quality eggs, okay, things like that. You wanna get those omega-3s in a whole food form whenever you possibly can. Okay, even good quality like grass-fed meat is going to have omega-3s. Uh, today's video sponsor is Thrive Market which is an online membership-based grocery store. Now, I'm not making any claims about Thrive Market, but if you like sardines, if you like things like that, they have a tremendous selection of foods that are rich in omega-3s, but they also have a tremendous selection of just pantry staples in general. So they have been a sponsor on this channel for a number of years. Uh, there is a link down below if you wanna check them out. So you go online, you order whatever you need to get from Thrive, and then it gets delivered to your doorstep within a couple of days, easy peasy, saves a bunch of time, saves me a bunch of money because I'm not going to the grocery store, I'm not having to deal with that, I'm a busy guy with busy kids and all this stuff. So anyway, that link down below will save you 25% off your first order, but it will also get you a free gift when you use that link because that is a special link because they're a sponsor on this channel. So check them out after this video. Okay, now we have to talk about the oxidative stress side for a second. This one is a little bit frustrating because it's a two-part situation and people really get them confused. There is a difference between lipid peroxidation, oxidation of an actual fat, okay, and oxidative stress in the body. There is a difference, okay? There is some evidence that omega-3s can trigger oxidative stress, okay? Kind of wild, like I don't know who's here wanting to bag on omega-3s because they're generally pretty good, but people out there do, okay? Trigger oxidative stress. Well, why are they saying this? Well, it has to do once again with the electron transport chain. It's that same argument. They're saying, okay, because the electron transport chain can potentially get disrupted by omega-3s, which we found to be somewhat untrue, uh, only in high amounts, right? Because of that, you can increase the amount of rogue electrons, electrons that are disrupted when they're going through the electron transport chain and ultimately result in uh, reactive oxygen species. Okay, they go out and they create more oxidative stress. Again, could be founded if you're taking absurd amounts. The other thing that people get confused with is they think oxidative stress means an oxidated fish oil pill. That is a whole different situation. We'll talk about in a minute when I explain like how to choose a fish oil. But a fish oil that goes rancid or oxidizes is a different situation. And that comes down to just choosing good quality fish oils that don't oxidize. Okay, so that's a different situation altogether. That really doesn't have much to do with the omega-3s and the mechanistic actions within the body. So when we look at research, we see that omega-3s seem to have the opposite effect on oxidative stress. There's a study that was published in the journal PLOS-1. Okay, this took a look at 700 pregnant women, 165 of them were consuming omega-3s. So they took a look and they tested what is called their 8 ISO prostaglandin F2 alpha scores. Okay, so they looked at these particular levels within their body. And they found, oh, well, these levels actually are lower, indicative of lower oxidative stress. So the women that were taking omega-3s had less oxidative stress in their body. So again, it comes down to the dose, right? If you're taking copious amounts, then yeah, you're disrupting the mitochondrial function and you probably could have some reactive oxygen species and, and stress, right? But if you're taking regular amounts, then it seems to be pretty beneficial. So quickly, like choosing the right fish oil, one of the things you wanna look for, and I'm gonna do a separate video breaking this down, but you wanna look for fish oil that is in a full triglyceride form. You'll see two forms. You'll see one that is a fish 
fish oil bound to an ethyl ester. Uh, that's going to be bound to ethanol, so it's called a fish oil ethyl ester, which you can see if you look on the label. Okay, or you'll see ones that are in a full triglyceride form, like salmon oils or some krill oils, most commonly cod liver oil, which is my personal favorite because you're also getting vitamin A and vitamin D along with it. So I highly recommend you take a cod liver oil pill rather than try to like waste your time trying to find the right one. It just makes more sense. Uh, triglyceride form is going to absorb better. Okay, there's some interesting evidence that shows that a triglyceride form is gonna absorb at about 180% versus 160% in an ethyl ester form. The other thing we have to remember is with an ethyl ester form, that can potentially go rancid faster. Okay, so when we talk about oxidation and rancidity, that's what we have to worry about. There's a study that was published in the Journal of the American Oil Chemist Society that took a look at triglyceride form versus ethyl ester form. Okay, they found that at all temperatures, the ethyl ester form oxidized faster. Now, in some ways, the triglyceride form was a little bit more volatile, uh, but not necessarily from an oxidation standpoint. It was pretty standard that the ethyl ester form could not handle the same temperatures that, say, a triglyceride form could. You still want to look for ones that have a low, what is called TOTOX score, which you can usually look up and find on their website if they're proud about it. You want to look for ones that are uh, caught and then either just immediately put in the dark and put in the cold. There's a lot of different things that need to be looked at to really fine tune what is perfect. But one of the most important things I want you to pay attention to is if you look at the ingredients, are there other oils added? Did they add soybean oil? Did they add sunflower oil? Did they? Because vegetable polyunsaturated fatty acids have different oxidation rates than omega-3 polyunsaturated fatty acids do. A polyunsaturated fatty acid from a fish oil is not going to oxidize as fast as a vegetable polyunsaturated fatty acid. So this is something to be paying attention to. So I hope that this cleared up some of the myths and gave you some tips on choosing a fish oil. As always, keep it locked in here on my channel, and as always, try to go whole foods whenever you possibly can. I'll see you tomorrow.